Heavy snow and wind are a deadly combination. During the winter of 1880-1881, they brought one Minnesota railroad to its knees. This man had to tie a rope to his door handle as he walked to the barn so he could find his way back. Snow and wind can also create monstrous drifts as the snow is pushed horizontally along the ground. Any space that is not level with the ground collects the snow, like a railroad cut through the surrounding terrain. We are going to focus on the Chicago, St. Paul, Minneapolis and Omaha railway line from St. Paul to Sioux City. Like other railroads, this line had gone through several ownership changes over the years. Obviously, the four cities in the railroad's name were the major destination points. But again, we are going to narrow our focus to the stretch between St. Paul, Minnesota and Sioux City, Iowa. To help finance its construction, the railroad was given millions of acres of land along its track to sell to farmers and ranchers. Any bad press it received could affect its ability to sell this land. Most of this railroad land was in southern Minnesota, but a portion was in northwest Iowa. The segment from St. Paul to Mankato followed the Minnesota River, so it was protected from the wind. However, it was still susceptible to heavy snow. The elevation generally ranged from 800 to 1100 feet. You can see more red colors on the topographical map from St. James to Sioux City, which correspond to elevations from 1100 to 1600 feet. This higher terrain meant more railroad cuts, which were more susceptible to blowing snow. During the winter of 1880-1881, Thomas Gear was in charge of the St. Paul to St. James section, and John F. Lincoln was in charge of the Sioux City to St. James section. In October 1880, wheat was still king in Minnesota, and the fall harvest was underway. Then came a great storm from the 15th to the 17th, which interrupted the harvest and life in general. A northbound train got stuck in the snow near Sheldon, Iowa, where it remained for 36 hours. There was likely nothing to eat for the passengers, except what was brought along on the cars. The conductor recalled that even with the snow and cold, the flies inside the cars were still thick enough that they couldn't sleep. Updates along the line were unavailable as telegraph lines were downed and the mail could not get through. The Nobles County Fair in Worthington was ended prematurely due to the weather. Ducks and geese migrated southward, heavily laden with snow. One goose dropped onto the street in Wyndham, where it was picked up alive. By October 18th, the railroad had reopened from St. Paul to St. James, but remained closed beyond. The next day, the snowbound Sheldon train reached Sioux Falls Junction, where it derailed. The passengers were taken by sleigh to Worthington. Around 6 p.m., the derailed train finally arrived in Worthington, and around 10 p.m., the entire line reopened. The storm knocked down so many telegraph poles that the company decided to rebuild the entire line with 30-foot tall poles set five feet into the ground. It was said that the railroad had not been blockaded for over two days by snow for six years. It took longer than anticipated to clear the tracks because the snow plows had not been readied yet for winter. The railroad was blocked for a total of four days from this early season blizzard. Turning to November, another storm hit on the 10th and 11th. This resulted in delays mainly between Medelia and Worthington. Wood and coal were scarce along the line. The railroad claimed it did not have enough rail cars to meet the demand. Farmers were still trying to finish the fall harvest, so they had not been hauling much wood. There was only one day of blockage during the month of November 1880. Then, in December, 
there was a three-day storm from the 4th to the 6th. Most of the closure areas were between St. James and Sioux City. On the 5th, a burning railroad car was discovered along the riverfront in St. Paul. Before it was put out, the fire spread to two other cars and briefly threatened the freight depot. On the 10th, a horse team in Mankato became frightened and ran in front of a locomotive. Both horses were injured and the sled was smashed to pieces. Logging in the Big Woods region of Minnesota was finally begun in earnest. It was said that within a mile or two of Mankato, there were thousands of cords of wood just lying on the ground. Hundreds of men were wanted to chop and haul the wood. Rural families also needed fuel. One day, a man near Mountain Lake counted 101 teams with sleighs on their way to find timber. Some had already traveled 35 miles. The Omaha Railway sent 150 men into LeSueur County to chop and haul wood. The railroad needed wood itself, but it was also responsible for supplying the settlers along its route. Soon, a vast army of men were chopping wood east of Mankato. A single man could cut two cords of wood a day and make up to one dollar per cord. It didn't take long until about 1,000 cords of wood arrived in Mankato a day. You couldn't look in any direction without seeing teams hauling wood into town. Buyers came from long distances away. The Storm King arrived again at the end of December. Operations were suspended on the 26th, and an attempt to reopen the line was made the following day. One train got stuck near Lake Crystal on the 27th. The men in the train formed a shovel brigade, finally allowing the train to break through. It must have been a helpless feeling to be stuck in the middle of nowhere. Another train with about 20 passengers was snowed in at the town of Mountain Lake for three days. Luckily, they could get food and board in town, but the train was left to the elements. A number of railroad officials were also snowed in at Wyndham, where they found shelter from the storm. Rail service opened between St. Paul and St. James on the 28th and 29th, but remained closed between St. James and Sioux City. Superintendent Gear's shoveling crew got stuck west of St. James on the 29th, but by the 30th, trains were running on time again. The passenger trains had to push through small drifts occasionally. One passenger said it was a decidedly cool reception as the snow settled over them. They also felt a little nervous, not knowing if they were still on the track or not. There were six more days of closures along the Omaha line in December, bringing the total up to 11 for the winter. On January 7th, a freight train broke through a bridge near Bigelow, Minnesota, knocking several cattle cars into the ditch. This accident briefly closed the railroad line. Back-to-back -back storms from the 12th to 15th resulted in more problems for the railroad. To avoid stranding passengers, all trains pulled into the nearest station and stopped. It took until January 17th for the track to be cleared again. Several days later, another three-day storm struck southwestern Minnesota. One train pulled into Wyndham on the 20th and stopped. The train from St. Paul reached Mankato and could get no further. Three men who were snowed in at Jackson hired a team to take them to Wyndham, where they found the trains weren't moving there either. On January 24th, the road reopened again. This was followed by another event on the 26th that resulted in another closure. Basically, the railroad was blocked at Mankato. Newspaper editors stated that there had never been a winter with so many shutdowns. Drifting even occurred in the wooded areas between St. Paul and Mankato. The rail line was cleared of snow on January 27th. Hundreds of backlogged rail cars waited to be distributed along the line. Newspapers encouraged anyone who was unemployed 
to shovel snow for the railroads, where they could make 30 cents per hour. A heavy snowstorm struck on January 30th and 31st, shutting down the railroad again. Most of the impacts were felt southwest of Lake Crystal. The snow-filled railroad cuts were getting quite deep and were only about the width of the rail cars. After each event, more snow was piled up along the top edges, essentially making an even deeper cut. If a person was in a cut when a locomotive came along, the results could be deadly. In January 1881, there were 12 more days the rail line was closed, bringing the winter total up to 23. As the railroad began running again on February 1st, one train made it into Wyndham. The newspapers in St. Paul were clamoring about an egg famine, as the price in town had skyrocketed to 65 cents per dozen. On February 2nd and 3rd, the region was visited by another snowstorm. Trains going southbound could only get as far as Mankato before turning back. Another storm followed from the 4th to the 6th. Passenger trains were stuck at Worthington, Heron Lake, and Mountain Lake. At least the passengers could get off the trains and move around the towns. The road remained shut down on the 5th. Residents around Heron Lake burned their furniture and flooring to keep warm. On February 6th, Reverend Gunn walked the 27 miles from St. James to get back to Wyndham. After the first eight miles, he stopped at the Butterfield Depot and warmed himself by the fire. He set out again for the seven miles to Mountain Lake. To keep his bearings, he followed the tops of the telegraph poles. The reverend would occasionally sink into the snow, almost over his head, so he had to lie flat and roll to get out. After a brief rest at Mountain Lake, he headed out again. The final 12 miles to Wyndham took him about five hours to walk. On the 7th, a passenger train from St. Paul could not even reach Mankato and had to turn back at Lesseur. It had the assistance of eight snowplows and eight shoveling crews, but even that was not enough. The snow was reported to be about two feet deep all along the route to Lesseur, and it was wet and heavy. The plows could only push it forward into a pile where the shovelers had to throw it aside. A crew in Mankato battled deep drifts on the tracks near Franklin School. Franklin School was located on the northern edge of town, in the shelter of the Minnesota River Valley. The plow ran back and forth, crashing into the drifts and sending up huge waves of snow. Flying chunks of ice and snow were known to snap the telegraph wires along the track. On the west end, three engines and 300 shovelers worked to clear the tracks. The shovelers worked very long days. By February 8th, the road was opened from St. Paul to Lake Crystal. By the 9th, the road had opened to St. James, and by the 10th, work continued to the southwest. Since no mail or news could get through, the Wyndham newspaper printed a single blizzard edition on the 10th. In the woods around Mankato, the snow was three and a half feet deep. It was so deep that all wood chopping and hauling was suspended. February 11th and 12th brought another snowstorm. The first day, the 11th, a plow and crew of shovelers got snowed in near Butterfield and had to spend the night on the train. That was likely an uncomfortable night for the tired men. The second day, three men from St. James brought provisions to the trapped men, risking their lives to do so. On the 13th, work continued to clear the track between Medelia and Worthington. By the 14th, a closed section was between St. James and Heron Lake. On the 15th, the closed segment had shrunk even more. At 4 p.m. on February 16th, Superintendent Gear's crew reached a dead engine nine miles west of St. James, which had been abandoned since the first. 
the engine had left its passenger cars at Mountain Lake before getting stuck. After freeing the engine, the crew worked into Mountain Lake and helped free the rest of the passenger train. This allowed the railroad line to finally reopen at 4.40 p.m., lifting the 15-day blockade. About 50 passengers had been stranded in Mountain Lake and Heron Lake those 15 days. It took a well-coordinated effort to clear the tracks. Like a conquering hero, Gear arrived back in St. Paul on the 17th in a double-headed train made up of the two trains that had been stuck. During this early February stretch, Gear made his headquarters at St. James. He employed three large shoveling crews to work in tandem with the snowplows. Many drifts were so high and hard-crusted that the shovelers had to reduce their proportions before the plow could move in. A telegraph operator and a telegraph line reporter accompanied each working party so Gear could stay informed of their progress and needs. The work went on night and day. One crew worked 29 straight hours, while another crew worked 31 out of 36 hours. Food and hot coffee were sent to the crews from St. James. Gear felt anyone who was angry about being trapped would understand after seeing the mountainous snowdrifts on their way out. And some of those trapped passengers were quite annoyed. General John Cook and several other soldiers were snowed in at Mountain Lake. They held a meeting and sent a blistering attack on the railroad to the St. Paul Pioneer Press. Locals said these men should be hauled out of town and left in a snowbank. Another trapped passenger was so angry, he swore at every railroad employee he saw. However, his attitude changed after seeing the energetic shoveling crews. When he was on the train heading home again, he said he could hug any train man, even a homely Norwegian, who had laughed at him when he got hit by a flying chunk of snow. The railroads didn't like the bad press they were receiving. One official bought the negatives of a plow at work along his line, so the photographer couldn't sell reproductions. That cost him a lot of money, though. With the line open, hundreds of freight cars were sent toward their destinations. The train that had been snowed in at Mountain Lake contained a large amount of silver, so it had been closely guarded. One of the hotels ran out of wood, so the landlord tore down his fences to cook his meals allowing the fire to go out in between. The occupants survived on bread, salt pork, and beans. Unrelenting snow and windstorms continued from the 19th through 24th, and the 25th and 26th. Somewhat surprising, there was also a fuel famine in Minneapolis. General Manager Charles F. Hatch ordered that wood from Minneapolis should have preference over all other freight. Even a relatively large city was hurting for wood and coal. To keep the tracks clear, Superintendent Gear tried a new plan. He had a plow and crew of shovelers make two runs a day between Mankato and St. James, trying to stay ahead of the snow. After only being open two days, the line was shut down again on February 19th by blowing snow. Rain also fell at times, icing over the huge drifts and making the plows ineffective. This required more manual labor to help the plows. The crews progressed to Lake Crystal on the 22nd, then to St. James on the 23rd, before having to start all over again in Lake Crystal. A member of the Minnesota legislature from St. James walked to Lake Crystal in order to catch a train for St. Paul. Thirteen travelers stuck at St. James hired a team and sleigh to bring them to Mankato. They were so happy to finally arrive, they burst out in song. By the end of February, the railroad had only been reopened to St. James. For most of the month, there had barely been six hours without a drifting breeze along the line. To understand the frustrations of the passengers, a Minneapolis resident traveled to Sibley, Iowa, where he got stuck by a storm. He waited all day for a train that didn't come. 
On the 21st, he boarded a train of shovelers and assisted them to Worthington, where he was stuck again. On the 23rd, he boarded another train of shovelers and assisted them to Heron Lake. At these stops, fuel was scarce, and there was not much food. Some people were surviving on bad coffee and bread. He and five other railroad men set out on the morning of the 24th on foot, reaching Wyndham for lunch and Mountain Lake by early evening. The next day, most of the group set out again, but they quickly encountered a blizzard. They managed to reach St. James that afternoon, more dead than alive. The Minneapolis man hired a team to take him to Medelia and a sleigh to get him to Mankato. At Mankato, he could finally catch a train back to St. Paul. The man said that between Mountain Lake and St. James, there was not a fence, house, tree, or shrub to see as a reference. They could only follow the telegraph poles along the line. He said they walked on top of snowdrifts that were 20 feet high, not falling through because they were iced over. They wrapped their boots with flour sacks for added warmth. Most towns had a kerosene shortage. Residents who ran out were left in the dark. Some people who ran out of food and fuel moved into the hotels in the various towns. The month of February only had three days with an open railroad line, bringing the total number of closures for the winter to 48 days. March had barely begun when another storm blocked the railroad again. The usual area between Lake Crystal and Worthington was shut down. By March 4th, only the stretch between St. Paul and Mankato remained open. Again, the crusted snow had to be loosened by the work of the shovelers. By the 8th, the railroad was open to St. James, but remained closed further west. On March 10th, the stretch between St. James and Wyndham was still shut. The huge drifts and piles by the side of the tracks made the work very slow. On March 10th, an engine and four cars were thrown from the track near Shakopee. After a saboteur put a piece of rail across the track. This delayed traffic along the line for a different reason. Exactly a week later, another three-day storm hit southwestern Minnesota. Tragedy occurred near Mankato on the 12th when a young woman was overtaken and killed by a train in one of the snow cuts. There was really nowhere to go in that situation. It was just a dangerous area to walk. On March 13th, the 20-foot high snowdrift, 400 feet long, had to be cleared off the track. To get a perspective, a football field is 360 feet long. A goal post is 35 feet high, so the drift would have been over halfway up the post. Between Medelia and St. James, the railroad had to remove 4 to 11 feet of snow the entire distance, as if it had been a solid cut 11 miles long. Can you imagine having to remove this much snow for 11 miles? By the 14th, the railroad continued to battle the deep snow between St. James and Hospers. In Worthington, the newspaper editor had to tunnel out of his office after a large drift covered his front door. It was still hard to catch a break, with another system in mid-March adding to the struggle. On the 16th, the work of clearing the railroad continued between St. James and Alton. Near Alton, the work was slow because ice was found at the bottom of every snow cut. This would have been really slow, tedious work. Like clockwork, another three-day storm raged from March 19th to 21st. A snowplow and group of shovelers that had left St. James on the 20th had only progressed two miles when the wind came up. They had to stop, turn around, and shovel their way back to St. James for the night. By the 21st, the road remained closed from Adelia to Sioux City. It was hard for the railroad to keep their shovelers. Most didn't think the work would continue day after day, and it was physically demanding work. Tragedy struck again on March 21st, when a train overtook a group of eight men on a handcar 
in another snow cut near Mankato. Most of the men leapt to safety, except one, who was paralyzed with fear. This man was killed by the collision. On March 23rd, there were three stretches of railroad line that were still closed. At St. James, the telegraph operator watched the progress of the work through a spyglass from the hotel roof. The railroad opened to St. James the next day. Once the road had reopened, the cut east of St. James was surveyed and found to be about 3,000 feet in length and 24 and a half feet in depth. In the warm season, the railroad grade in this spot was only one and a half feet lower than the surrounding terrain. In late March 1881, after being shoveled out numerous times, it had grown to 24 and a half feet deep. To visualize that, this is an example of what a passing engine might have looked like during the warm season. With 24 and a half feet of snow on the ground, the engine would not have been visible from the side. Can you imagine the labor it would have taken to use a pick to loosen the snow and then having to throw the snow up 24 and a half feet to the top? Another nearby cut that was 18 feet deep was said to have started by a fringe of weeds near the side of the track. By March 28th, there were still a few sections of track that needed to be cleared. The following day, a little more progress was made. On the 30th, the road was reopened north of Worthington, but remained closed to the south. Although the road was very close to being reopened, the relentless winter continued with another storm to close out the month. Then it was back to square one. The only section open on the 31st was from St. Paul to Mankato. Trains were stalled along the line again. Superintendent Gear was on the train, stuck just east of Wyndham, and recounted that after being out in the storm for 10 minutes, his face was coated with ice. His boss, General Manager Hatch, had also been out on a tour of the line. His train was also stranded at Sibley, Iowa. The towns along the railroad line appreciated the efforts the railroad was making to reopen the line, but they weren't happy that no backup plan was made to get the mail through by some other means. There was not a day in March that the railroad line was open, bringing the total for the winter up to 79 days. Hatch was injured on April 1st near Sibley, Iowa. Crews were still working in that area to clear several segments of the railroad. Hatch was on a hand car with several other railroad officials in between Worthington and Sibley when he fell off the car. He was not run over but suffered significant injuries. On April 3rd, another blizzard occurred along the railroad line. By the 5th, there were still several small segments closed. This was whittled down to one segment by the 6th. The last time the entire line had been opened was back on February 17th and 18th. Another accident occurred on April 6th, where the crews were working to clear the tracks near Bingham Lake. It was thought the plow would push through cut one and stop in cut two, so the shovelers continued to work in cut three. However, the plow barreled through cut two and continued into cut three, smashing into the shovelers who were working there. One man was killed outright, and four were injured. By 6 p.m. on the 7th, the road was clear again, but more snow was already falling. Snow fell through the 8th and 9th, clogging the road one more time. The shutdown was mainly between St. James and Sibley. Good progress was made by the 10th, with just a few small segments still needing to be cleared. Throughout this region, 50 or so cuts filled in with two to three feet of snow. Then another three-day storm hit from the 10th to the 12th. On the 12th, crews worked to clear the road between St. James and Sioux City. The next day, six crews were at work battling the snow. On April 14th, only three segments remained. The following day, only two segments were left. Finally, on April 16th, the line reopened and the snow was melting all along the line. 
Freight began moving up and down the track, restocking the depleted towns. Only two days later, a new issue began to pop up due to the warm weather. Washouts. Water from the melting snow overflowed the track in several places. The grueling winter of 1880-1881 brought a renewed push to plant more trees for fuel and windbreaks. This push resulted in a record number of orders for young trees. Adding 14 more days of closure in April brought the winter total to 93. This was definitely a winter for the record books. That concludes the video. Make sure to check out my other YouTube videos and my primary website at mnbricks.com.